My name is Elena Cherney. I'm the Global Energy Editor at The Wall Street Journal. Welcome to this strategic update on the future of energy and the major drivers of transformation. We're having this conversation at a moment of unprecedented upheaval and change in energy markets, both in the short term and in the much longer term. In the short term, we're witnessing a rebalancing between supply and demand after a two-year price collapse that has been punishing for energy producers, oil exporting economies, and has sapped investment in the sector around the world. The, short, the recovery in prices is playing out against the much longer term and more fundamental shift in the way that the world produces, distributes, and consumes energy. That shift is, is moving toward a lower carbon economy and away from the kind of fossil fuel dependence that has defined economies for, well, probably since the Industrial Revolution. Um, that movement seems to be uh, difficult to deny. The momentum is there. The questions, though, are looming around how quickly this change will take place, what it will mean, what will be the sources of energy that replace the ones that we're currently using, what it will mean for consumers, policymakers, and especially the energy industry, um, many of whom are, many parts of which are represented here today. I'd like to start by asking, uh, by introducing our panelists and then asking each of them to give a viewpoint on how these drivers of change affect them and, and where they see things going. We have here Dr. Fatih Birol, the International Energy Agency, um, Kenneth Hirsch, who is the co-founder and chairman of NG Management, Amin Nasser, the CEO of Saudi Aramco, Francesco Storace, the CEO of Enel, and Chao Baoping, the chairman of China Guodian Corp. Let me start with Dr. Biral. Help us to understand some of the shorter term, if there's both a short term upheaval and a longer term upheaval um, underway, help us to understand in 2016, what were some of the key moments that have brought us to this moment of rebalancing or tentative rebalancing in markets? But how does that also connect to the much longer term question of where demand is going? You and I, before we came in, we were talking about the question of peak demand, peak oil demand. Um, help us to understand where we are now short term, but also what some of these bigger term questions, longer term questions are, and how we may get there. Uh, thank you, and good morning to everybody. So you ask a very comprehensive question. First, perhaps three important, in my view, data developments, what happened last year, and a bit of the, uh, the oil demand peak, the famous uh, question. For me, a, a key development was last year when you get the global electricity markets, when you look at the, all the new power plants installed last year, more than 50% of them was renewables alone and less than half coal plus oil plus gas plus nuclear put together. So which means nuclear pardon, uh, renewables was the main choice for the uh, utilities uh, for the uh, governments. And for the first time we have seen installed capacity coming from renewables was higher than everybody else, which showed us that renewables are not anymore a romantic Western song. It's a business, it is happening, and people make money off that. This is number one. Number two, in terms of coal, coal means China. Half of the coal is used today in China, other half rest of the world. Two years in a row, last year it was again confirmed, Chinese coal consumption is in a decline. This is the second important one. Third important one, finishing with oil, we have seen low oil prices and an agreement uh, between uh, OPEC and non-OPEC countries. Now, these are three, I thought, uh, important developments uh, there, in addition to there are many other things under LNG and so on, but just to pick up these three. When looking at the future, peak oil demand, you mentioned, there is a lot of discussion. I just came this morning from uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, like uh, uh, to, uh, with uh, His Excellency uh, uh, here. Now, everybody is talking about electric cars, and therefore, oil demand is, we are going to see soon a peak oil demand. 
I don't agree with that. Uh, I agree that we will see more and more and increasingly more electric cars. They will penetrate the markets. But cars are one of the drivers of oil demand growth. There are other drivers, which are trucks, planes, ships, and petrochemical industry, which will continue to push the oil demand growth. And as such, while I agree that the oil demand growth may be slower in the future than in the past, oil demand will continue to uh, grow at a slower pace. Mm. And just looking at the car manufacturing, and from that, extrapolating for the global oil demand growth may not be uh, uh, the right way uh, to do it, I would say. Um, Mr. Nasser, if I can ask you to pick up on this. Um, if Dr. Biral is right, there will be some time to, to go uh, for fossil fuels. This is not imminent. Uh, other people have voiced different views on, on peak demand. So you have quite a bit of time. There will be a lot of demand for um, Saudi Aramco's oil. But as I understand it, the company is taking steps to diversify and to prepare for a day uh, when taking oil out of the ground may not be as good a business as it is right now. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing and where you see demand going, why you're taking the steps that you're taking. Thank you and good morning. And I agree with uh, Dr. Fatih that there is a, a global uh, transformation that is currently undergoing. And it is putting a lot of pressure on uh, the oil and gas industry, the petroleum industry, uh, mainly also uh, because of climate change and uh, government policies and technology advancement. Uh, the two key questions I think Fatih also uh, alluded to is uh, uh, energy mix and timing. Uh, with regard to uh, the two areas that will be impacted, uh, power generation and uh, uh, the light vehicle uh, uh, industry. Uh, with regard to power generation, which will be impacted, today, if you look at it, 23% is in renewable. But in new renewable, solar and wind, it's only 4%. So they still have a long way to go to uh, be a dominant, uh, create a dominant impact on the power generation over the long term. If you look at China, even though there is, it is in the decline, but it's still 70 percent of full power generation in China is on coal, 80 percent in India, 45 percent in Germany, and even in the U.S. it's almost one-third in, in, in coal today. In the electric vehicles, which is something very important, and it is it impacts oil in particular, uh, there is today 1.2 million uh, vehicles worldwide in electric, out of a fleet of about 1.2 billion. Uh, looking at the IA uh, forecast, by 2040, there will be approximately 150 million electric vehicles, which is, but the fleet will go from 1.2 billion to 2 billion. So basically, 8% penetration in the light vehicle industry. And as Vitya also mentioned, the oil is not all in light vehicle industry or uh, some of it small part in, in power generation, but heavy uh, trucks, Aviation, shipping, 30%. 15% is in petrochemical, in loops, and in bitumen. So yes, uh, renewable will gain a market share uh, over the long term, but it, they will not be dominant and it will take decades for them to replace uh, petroleum resources. So what we are doing in Saudi Aramco, we are building our capacity in the oil. We are the most reliable producer. We have a maximum sustained capacity of 12 million barrels per day. We, uh, the kingdom has a capacity of 12 and a half million barrels per day. We continue to build our capacity. We are expanding our gas portfolio, where we will be doubling our gas over the next decade. And power generation in the kingdom will be 70% on gas. So basically, will be the highest worldwide in terms of power generation using uh, gas, uh, which will allow us to avail more crude uh, to the market. Uh, our forecast, there is healthy demand. We, see, we saw it in 2016, 1.4 million barrels per day. 2017, we're talking about 1.3 million barrels per day. You need to take into account, even looking at IA prediction by 2040 for oil demand, and the worst scenario, talking about 73 
the best scenario talking about 117 with a base case of 103. That, so there is a growth in the oil sector, even by 2040, even if you look at 2060. So we need to be prepared uh, for that, and we are building our capacity to be uh, prepared for that. So I think hydrocarbon resources will be with us for decades. Uh, there will be uh, an expansion needed uh, in the sector, and there will need to be a lot of capital that we look at the amount of capital that will be required to build the, uh, uh, the requirement to meet the 2040 and 2060 predictions. <laughs> In the next just quarter of a century, you are talking about $25 trillion. So this uncertainty about renewables and the impact on hydrocarbon resources should not really deter us from putting the right capital investment to meet the future. Otherwise, there will be spikes in prices, and the global economy will be impacted as a result of that. In other words, the economy may be moving, and many countries may be moving toward adoption of more non-fossil fuel power, but the percentage is so high right now of fossil fuel uh, generation that the hydrocarbons will remain necessary and will in fact continue to grow for some time. Is that what you're... I agree with you. And even in areas where it's moving, for example, when you look at electric cars, 1.2 million, most of it is in developed countries developed economies where incentives are provided. When you're talking about a much bigger fleet of 1.2 going to 2 billion, incentives will be difficult to uh, be given in, in, in developing and developed countries for a bigger fleet. It is easy for a smaller fleet to provide incentives and encourage and put a lot of regulations around it. But when the fleet start to expand uh, to 2, 2 billion by 2040, it will be very difficult. And you're talking about 150 million, even with that, it is manageable, manageable within with the growth that we are seeing. Now, if I may add something here, leave aside it. I give you one uh, uh, other other example. Uh, last year was the record sales of electric cars. Yes. And what that meant was less than one car out of hundred cars sold was electric cars. Ninety nine was the traditional. Uh, one is electric cars. And if we were to assume as of tomorrow. Every second car sold was an electric car, not one out of 100, but every second car was an electric car. For 25 years, global oil demand will still continue to grow. Yeah. Because the growth is not coming from cars, it's coming from so, trucks. One third of the global oil demand growth today comes from the Asian trucks only. Trucks in Asia are responsible of one third of the oil demand growth with no efficiency standards or no substitution impact. So. No, I think, let's come back to this. I think some people would argue that that could change. There could be technological breakthroughs, breakthroughs in storage, breakthroughs that would bring down the cost of electric vehicles, and that that could, <laughs> over time, that could change. But you need infrastructure. It will happen. You need the infrastructure, other than economic. You need the infrastructure to be built around that. And it takes years, decades, for to build the infrastructure. So it's not about just having the vehicles ready. You need the infrastructure to go with it. And that will take a lot of time to, to build. Electric cars will definitely happen. What I am trying to say is this doesn't explain that oil demand is going to peak. So this is what I want to say. Fair point. But at the same time, just to add to what you have said, what Aramco is doing, we are building our uh, capacity in petrochemicals and <coughs> in loops uh, as a company. We are also taking a strong position in solar. The kingdom is looking at 10 gigawatt by 2023. His Excellency, the Minister, just announced 30 to $50 billion. Uh, His Excellency, the Minister of Energy, Industry, and Mineral Resources, Engineer Khad al just announced 30 to $50 billion of investment uh, opportunities for in, in renewable in Saudi Arabia. This is by 2023, and the company is taking a strong position on renewable as well. So while uh, we are building our capacity in oil and gas, we are also uh, taking a strong position in renewables as well. Which will diversify and hedge against the exactly. chance that... Okay, let's jo uh, keep going and make sure that we get to, to uh, two more people here. Um, on the point of infrastructure, this is a very good point because it's key to the whole question of transformation across the energy sector. Um, in, in China, if I can ask uh, Mr. Chow, um, 
we saw recently, I mean, China's big challenge, coal remains a very huge source of power in China. The Chinese government has been very committed uh, to or taken steps to limit the growth of coal power. Um, and also, we've seen an interesting dynamic in terms of leadership on the global stage um, as the US appears less committed to the goals of the Paris Accord uh, with an incoming president who has signaled that he's not committed. China, for example, in Marrakesh, um, signaled that it very much was committed. Where do you expect a policy to go in China? And what is China Guodian doing um, in order to lessen its dependence on, on coal power? Well, thank you very much for that question. In my opinion, the Chinese government's stance on climate change and implementing the Paris Accord, taking up its social and global responsibility is an unwavering stance. It's an unwavering stance and a very firm stance. And I'd like to give a few examples of that. Firstly, President Xi Jinping at the Hangzhou summit last year made a very clear statement. He made a global commitment that China would continue firmly down the road of sustainable, low carbon and green development, energy saving, changing the environment, reducing emissions will continue to be a fundamental part of national policy. And that was number one. Secondly, green development, emission reductions and so forth have been incorporated in the 13th five-year development program, which has been passed by the National People's Congress of the People's Republic of China, which is a solemn commitment by the entire people. Of course, China also has commitments under the Paris Accord which it will not fail to fulfill. Thirdly, China advocates an innovative, balanced, green, open, and sharing development model. These are the five concepts of our development model. And a major support behind all of those is green development. Fourthly, in China, we talk about emission reductions, there's a very strong sense of greater responsibility and greater pressure in Chinese business today. If we talk just about thermal power in China, China already has the world's strictest emission standards for coal power stations, SOX and NOX respectively 35 milligrams and 50 milligrams, which are lower than the developed world, in fact. Now, I've just had a conversation with Mr. Birol, and we both uh, recognized the fact that China's thermal power is large in absolute and in percentage terms. Uh, it's currently 68% of the Chinese energy mix. Now, we have a country here of 1.4 billion people, and there's a historical background to that use of thermal power. So to change that mix that currently still heavily relies on thermal power is a long-term project, but that percentage is going down every year. The group I represent, China Guodian Corporation, has total IGC of 140, 140 gigawatts. That ranks us second among world power producers. And the majority of that is thermal power. But in the last few years, we have continued to accelerate our development of renewables. Hydro electric, we now have 16 gigawatts of hydroelectric installed. 25 0.7 gigawatts of wind power, both which rank us first among world power producers. We also have biomass, geothermal, and tidal generation underway. So 
The commitments are made by the Chinese government, but to a large extent they are fulfilled by Chinese businesses such as mine. And I am confident that China's emission reductions and green development will see greater progress in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I th Whoops. I think the, the infrastructure challenge that you outline is, is a very real one and is faced by power generators and utilities around the world. Um, Mr. Starace, Adenel, um, actually you've been quite vocal about your uh, perspective on, on climate change and the need to make change. Um, you told a UN uh, group that the survival of the planet is at risk and there is a pillaging we have taken for granted of our planet that needs to end. Um, tell us what you've done to end what you termed this pillaging. Well, I think you know, that, with that it's true that we have in a, we are in big transformation. Uh, this transformation has not the first that happened in the industry. It happened already uh, several times. Technology has always been through in the back of all this transformation. So it's also in this case technology is really driving it. Nothing new here. It's new technology, but it's always technology driving it. The scale is global. This is new. It was. It became global uh, in the past too. What What is really new now is that, for the first time, the energy industry is being transformed not only by the changes that happen in the industry, but also by some hybridization, some influence from other sector of the industry coming into. This is the first time in which you have industries like semiconductor, consumer electronics, having to do with energy. It's the first time in which you have such a big combination of forces changing. So that is the reason why we think it happens so quickly and with a speed that every time surprises us. I think the most striking example of this speed is the change that happens in China. I think a few years ago, we would never even thought about hearing China being at the forefront of this change. And today, China is leading it. It took us three years, maybe less. And I think we will continue to be surprised by the speed in which cars will become electric. The infrastructure investment to electrify a country is a fraction of what was spent to put in place the hydrocarbon infrastructure. It's really cheap. So I think the speed at which manufacturers will switch to electric is going to be phenomenal. And we will see cars becoming electric in very strange parts of the world, which today people don't think can become electrified. And in general, electricity will get into the use of industries that today don't use it. So what we have done, to answer your question, is that we basically took a step that said we will phase out thermal generation no more investment in thermal generation and substitute that with renewables that are constantly getting cheaper and better. And that is happening at the range of um, time. So basically, as plants get close to their uh, expiring technical life, we don't substitute them. We replace them with renewables. Technology is helping there too. So it's a question of just, uh, I think, maybe 10 years, 15. If you stop investing now, it's a question of 15, 20 years. That's the legacy we have to digest. But it is for sure going to happen. There's no question. And if you consider that the transformation is being accelerated by the, uh, by the influence of all the digital uh, industry coming into this, you have an incredible combination of uh, additional expansive use of electricity getting into areas that today people don't even think possible. You know, when, when steam was the, the primary, primary media, trains were moved by steam, and nobody even thought that they could be electrified. Um, we're seeing, obviously, in the US right now, a great deal of, of change and uncertainty um, around what the investment climate will be and, and how, how the uh, new incoming president will affect many sectors. Energy is one of them. He has pledged to um, deregulate and to uh, unshackle uh, drillers and, and explore exploration. Uh, Mr. Hirsch, tell us a little bit about what impact will that have, and um, how will that affect investment? Well. Um I'll speak as an asset allocator with a North American perspective um, because they have been such a swing producer. Um, the, um, 
the federal, the U.S. federal government has remarkably little to do with the growth in the oil and gas production in the United States. The United States has increased its oil production from 5 million barrels a day to over 9 million barrels a day under the Obama administration. Um, imagine what we could have done had they really wanted us to succeed. Um, the, uh, uh, and, and so what has happened uh, subsequent, to, because most of, the, most of the U.S. oil and gas production is on state and private lands. If you're looking for an example um, of technology, um, the technology isn't just outside the U.S. or the oil industry. The oil industry itself yeah. has responded to price signals in dramatic ways. And in my opinion, when OPEC decided in 2014 to cut prices, they were essentially looking at the United States as the high cost producer, the marginal producer. And essentially they uh, engaged in, a, in an economic war with the U.S. oil entrepreneur and lost and in effect brought down the cost structure of the entire planet. And now everybody is looking for ways to improve efficiency and improve pr productivity. And the U.S. the U.S. oil producers, the Canadian oil producers, and all over the world are are uh, adapting to a to uh, doing better in a lower price environment. And that has created uh, a resiliency uh, that we haven't seen. The resiliency has led to something quite dramatic in the oil markets, and that the oil markets are not just about OPEC anymore. The, op the producers and resource dependent producers are as important as a group as OPEC was. And now what's interesting is the, the agreement had more uh, people cutting who were non-OPEC members than were OPEC members. So 22 countries cut, 10 of them were OPEC members. So this is not a, uh, a cartel market anymore where when you're in abundant supply, producers react to market forces and they don't oversupply a market. If the U.S. oil, if the U.S. Auto automobile market is 17 million cars, auto, auto manufacturers won't produce 20 because that's the market. And I think that's what we're seeing is the oil business is now a real market driven uh, product, and it's no different than any, anything else. And so capital will flow to those places that can earn a competitive rate of return in light of the supply and demand numbers that the IEA and other people are talking about. And, uh, and I'm quite bullish on uh, the lower cost oil and gas producers because they will find a way uh, to, continuous, to continuously respond and serve the market uh, that isn't going anywhere in our lifetime. Uh, there's a lot in there. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit more about these market, but talk more about market forces and uh, the role that they're playing versus <coughs> policy making. But it's irresistible, uh, Mr. Nasser, to ask you whether you agree with Mr. Hirsch's analysis of what happened in 2014 and the reset of cost around the world, whether this in fact was this uh, showdown between um, American producers and, well, OPEC producers to some extent. Just what happened in 2014, there was more supply than demand. And it mainly coming from unconventional oil and some of it from tar sand or heavy oil. And that unconventional oil that came at a million barrels a year over five years, almost five million barrels of additional supply, which is uh, significant, put a lot of pressure on prices, brought prices down. I don't want to speak on behalf of uh, OPEC because that's not my role, but to me, it, there was a decision that is taken at that time that the market forces uh, find out and uh, balance the market by itself. And that is exactly what happened. Prices uh, went down. Uh, expensive uh, producers, you saw the 9.7 million barrels coming from the U.S. went this year to 8.7. One million barrels disappeared compared to a growth of one million barrels a year. Notice the difference, the huge difference between what used to happen. So the market forces brought the prices down. The, uh, the recent agreement, and I think it is stabilizing the market, the market is balancing. We're hoping by first half of 2017, there will be an equilibrium and there will be a growth because demand is, uh, what we are seeing is strong. There will be a need for more resources to come. And we are preparing ourselves to uh, avail the additional resources over the long term because we don't want what happened before to happen again. If no investment are uh, availed to the industry, prices will spike. Prices, of course, unconventional will pick up, right. will, but it will take time. Everything. But the U.S. unconventional has increased 
um, about half a million barrels a day on a $50 base, where um, two years ago it was unthinkable that oil, oil production in the United States would actually increase at $50. So we have brought down the cost of production, but it's now not a U.S. producer story. Um, the high, there's other high cost producers. But I don't world, know. I right? don't think it's increased. Because what happened between 14 and, and, and if you look at the total U.S. production, it's 9.7. It is around 8.7 today. So there is not uh, well, the low of 8.3. Yeah. 8 it's gone up to about 8.7. Right. And I mean, the, these days there is a growth a little bit. But uh, by the by the way, it is coming. Some of it coming from uh, liquids coming with the gas. So uh, there is an increase in the crude side, but it is limited in terms. It will take time. Sure. They need to see the prices uh, respond positively sustained over a period of time before additional capital come to the market to an, an investment comes and you will see right. more growth in the unconventional can, oil. Can I put this to one of our audience members? We have uh, Khalid Alfala here. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Alfala, <laughs> it's even more irresistible to ask you um, what you think. Was the uh, reaction in markets to the decision in 2014, and I, I know that was uh, a while ago, but was the reaction in markets to the decision in 2014 by OPEC to not intervene, um, what was expected at the time? Would you have forecast the degree of the price collapse, the um, length that it lasted, and the impact that it had, not just on shale producers in the U.S., but on Saudi Arabia and, and other OPEC producers? By the way, at that time, I was in a means. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, so I, I, I wanted to ask you carefully. Party to the decision, but I think as an observer, I would have expected uh, rational people around the table at OPEC to make exactly that decision because cutting and keeping the prices at three digits in 2014 would have kept what Ken was talking about, which is one million barrels year after year after year coming from expensive North American oil. And OPEC would have had to cut year after year after year. I would have expected Saudi production to be two to three million barrels below where it is in 2017 uh, under that scenario. So obviously, rationally, uh, that is not sustainable. In the past, OPEC had made supply reduction decisions, but they were in response to short-term events like the Asian financial crisis, like the recent financial crisis in 2007, 2008, to balance markets, or in response to disruptions elsewhere. Uh, this was a structural uh, deviation between supply and demand. As mentioned by a number of the speakers, demand for oil is growing at a slower scope, a slope uh, than before. And thanks to technology, entrepreneurship, uh, and the skills uh, across the industry, we're able to tap more resources uh, than we did before. But long term, that deviation between supply and demand at $100 prices would have meant that low cost producer would have taken themselves out of the market uh, completely. Now, $50 oil, we're seeing a recovery in North America, and we're thankful for this. I can speak in my capacity uh, as the oil minister of Saudi Arabia, looking at the long term in terms of decades, we need the contributions from all sources of the oil supply base. So uh, we hope that they will be able to maintain this. My expectations is that the cost will creep up. The supply industry has been decimated. And some of them are buying jobs today at $50 oil just to stay afloat. Once they see that their clients, the operators uh, in the shale and elsewhere, are uh, in the black, they will start raising costs. So I think costs will go up. They will, they will be uh, an inflation. And I think the balancing of, of the market in 2017 will also include an inflation on the cost of doing business. Also. What is being tapped recently in North America are the most prolific. And they're not going to provide two, three, four million barrels of incremental capacity. So as demand goes, they will go to the more expensive, more difficult, less prolific uh, areas in the shale 
and I think they will find that they need uh, higher prices. What that price that will balance the market, nobody knows. But I think in the long term, OPEC has learned way before me that ultimately what rules is the market. And OPEC is going to try to minimize fluctuations within the oil markets, but we cannot eliminate them. Certainly, we're not in the business of setting a price. $100 or $60 or $70 is no longer a realistic expectation. Some of the OPEC member countries may desire this, but we certainly cannot do it. I think, Dr. Birol, you wanted to make a comment? No, I'm just... Uh, Perhaps to this oil discussion to a bit wrap up that discussion. So there, there is a new oil world. This is with the shale oil coming in the picture. And uh, about the numbers, first of all, last year there was a drop. Yeah. But I expect this year uh, U.S. production will start to increase again. The numbers, all the indications are there as a result of the higher prices. Mm -hmm. This is number one. Number two, the, this will go. Prices will go up, U.S. and other production will come down and put downward pressure on the prices again and up and down. Therefore, the name of the game is we are entering a greater oil price volatility. You will see much more volatile prices because we will see the U.S. shale oil is very flexible with the prices, and I don't know what the equilibrium price is, but it is very flexible. This is number one. Number two. There is something to learn from the, uh, for the oil producing countries. We have seen the low oil prices, in my view, was a stress test for the economies of those countries, especially those who rely heavily on uh, oil and gas revenues went through difficult times. And it is the very time, in my view, to diversify the broaden the economy of those uh, countries. And as such, what Saudi Arabia is doing, United Arab Emirates is doing, or planning to do, is excellent. But the country which suffered the most uh, here is Russia. Russia suffered a lot, and Russia is the only country, only major producing country, which had a recession as a result of this process. And the third point uh, I wanted to uh, uh, mention uh, here, when we uh, look at the investment numbers, 2015 and 2016, global oil investments declined two years in a row. And it has never been the case in the history of oil that the oil, oil investment declined two years in a row. If there was a decline one year, next year there was a rebound. If we believe 2017 this year, if there are no major new investments are made, in two, three years of time, we may well see a significant gap between production and consumption, which I am not sure shale oil will be alone enough to uh, fill that gap. So therefore, in, in my view, alarm bells are ringing uh, for two years of time if no major investments made uh, this year. That's that. I say something just to add to what Fatih. You know, the oil cycle, even to put facilities on stream, it takes a long time. Talking about four to five years just to put one facility, certain increments. So to to build up the capacity, you need you need certainty. The issue is there is uncertainty because of all this. Uh, talk about renewables and the impact of renewables and whatever. Even IEA, to be honest with you, is not helping when they are putting their predictions or forecasts with a big 44 million barrels um, uh, a difference gap between the worst scenario and the best scenario. And that will be difficult even for investors to invest $25 trillion over the next 25 years. But to put that much that of an investment. I think that's just that wanted to. No, let me just uh, put it. It is different policies if the world goes to follow the way, a two degrees trajectory. Yeah. It will have implications on the uh, hydrocarbons. But if the world keeps as it is going, it will be different. So different worlds with different results. We are putting, if you follow this policy, you end up with this. But if you don't like it, follow this policy, go as it is. Pro-environment, pro-climate, or business as usual, or others. I, why don't you jump in? But I want to clarify that statement. I just wanted to, to uh, take a point that Mr. Nasser just brought up. This issue of time is really important if we, con if we consider the implications. 
the industry that needs a cycle as long as five years or longer is intrinsically risky because everything is compressed. Our decisions need to have an horizon that is shorter than that. And the reason why we do that is because the uncertainty about the evolution of the markets, the evolution of technology, the evolution of customer behaviors, the crisis of economy is such that you cannot reliably plan ahead five years and hope you're right. I mean, we have to be humbled by the experience of the last years. Yeah. Okay? So what cure is there? The cure is just go in things that can get resolved in two years, that you can plan an investment and execute it within that period. That's, I think, a lot safer, and that's actually what's killing many technologies today. That's really one of the most risky parts of our energy business, the long-term view that we are used to have when the world was much more predictable. That is no more the case, and either we understand and adapt and get out of technologies that require that time, or we risk a lot. And the volatility of oil, which has always been there, it's not nothing particularly new, the fact that it increases going forward is a classic indicator of intrinsic riskiness. That's what I think. And that's the reason why we said in our company we will not plan and execute and invest in anything that will require more than three years to be realized. So which rules out also large hydro, for nuclear. example. Nuclear. Rules out nuclear. Nuclear, yeah. large coal, large hydro. Right. But a lot of other alternatives are there. Mr. Chow, do you want to comment on that? Because you have to, uh, you alluded earlier to how difficult it is uh, in a country so big with so many needs to uh, make a change off, off coal, for example, and that these projects are very, very long term, involve huge infrastructure commitments. Um, tell us a little bit more about how you go about making those decisions and moving from uh, what you have now to the, the renewables and other sources of of power. Well, thank you very much. Um, transforming the Chinese development model and energy mix is a big ask. In particular, with a still high share of thermal power in our energy mix. I envy the energy mixes that you have in countries like, for example, Switzerland with over 90% of renewables. You know, you have a tiny proportion of thermal and other countries are doing well. Italy, for example, um, there's some good uh, new energy projects in Saudi Arabia too. When it comes to China, as a Chinese power producer's CEO, what do I have to keep in mind? I think there may be four things. Firstly, we have to make a big push for that transformation, increase investment in renewables and new energy. Every year, we have 100 billion yuan of investment 60 to 70 percent of that is in new energy. And the total is, un is unchanged for this year's investment uh, objective. 70 percent or so of our investment is in renewables. So changing the energy mix, less thermal, more renewables is an overall trend in China. Secondly, we have to keep our eyes on the ball when it comes to technology. For example, the conversion rate of solar, storage, and the efficiency question when it comes to wind power. Those require greater technological investment. Thirdly, greater cooperation. Chinese companies need to get more international. They need to work with their peers. In particular, advanced companies in the field of new energy to bring some of these solutions to China to help that transformation of the energy mix. Fourthly, we have to push the goal of integration. 
we have to be more aware as power producers of our corporate citizenship as power producers. And we have to try to spread this consciousness about new energy, about new energy. If everyone, if all the 1.4 billion people of China do something to help achieve that goal, change their consumer behavior, reduce their energy usage, then that adds up to a lot of progress. If every single person in China changes their consumer habits, then that's a new kind of contribution that we can do to the world's efforts in this area. Now, no country can try to solve these problems on its own. No country can carry the baton for the whole world. We have to come together and all do our bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that's, I, I want to, yeah, sorry. And then after this, I'd like to see if there are any audience questions. Sure. Um, I think that point, the last point is a great one. Uh, actually, the last two points, I think, summarize from a capital allocator's perspective yeah. the problem. The, it took us 100 years to get where we are now. There's $60 trillion of invested capital in the energy complex globally. The estimates for the next 20 and 30 years are half again as much. Okay, And yet, all the numbers that we talk about, that, that money is not going to just be manufactured out of thin air. And so it's a question not of just policy, but of markets. You have to be doing things that are economically rational so that capital will be attracted, so that you have a stable outcome. This is an 8 to $10 trillion annual industry. And any uh, anytime there's an unnatural um, uh, policy that causes capital distortion to go in places that are uneconomic, over time, that erodes the people who are providing the subsidy. And we've seen it in countries that were too early um, on the renewable game, and they're now getting rid of their feed-in tariffs because it's, it's basically going to run over people that try to get in the way. So we have to make this a market-driven uh, solution, and the markets themselves are speaking. And so technology is real. Um, the oil complex is not going away. And a three to five year horizon for a single company is great, but for a planet, there's a massive free rider problem because there's 100 years of installed capacity that you're leveraging off of um, for your three to five year horizons. The oil and gas industry is a tough industry with people having to take 10 and 20 year bets. The US oil producer is only 9 million barrels a day. Russia's 11, Saudi Arabia is 10. So that's 30 million out of almost 100 million supply and demand. So the high cost producers are now elsewhere. And those take long lead times, they take certainty, they take policymakers who understand the markets, and uh, the oil and gas industry isn't going anywhere. We got to understand that capital's got to come from somewhere. Let's get uh, a question from the audience if there is one before we wrap up. Anyone have a question? Please, if you can introduce yourself. I'm DK Saraf, CEO of UNGC India. And uh, my question or the observation is uh, regarding the uh, relevance of oil in coming decades. Uh, because uh, as has been seen, uh, the cost of solar has been reducing phenomenally. Uh, solar is already uh, below gr uh, grid parity in more than 80 countries. Now the uh, s uh, solar storage, when it comes, uh, it would uh, make a further impact. The electric vehicles are coming. Uh, to give uh, energy to the uh, uh, vehicles uh, from solar. So uh, I think it's uh, time for the uh, oil and gas companies, the producing companies, uh, to wake up. I, I think it's a, a good wake-up call. Uh, it may not happen uh, in our lifetime. Uh, it may happen maybe 20 years uh, after. But 20 years, 30 years is also not a very big period in the history of uh, industries, not company, in the uh, history of industries. So I think uh, the oil and gas companies need to uh, uh, diversify into different type of businesses. Many of the country, uh, companies have already started uh, doing it. Uh, this is one. And uh, second is uh, on uh, clean energy. Uh, th this also would uh, further motivate uh, solar uh, energy um, uh, generation. Uh, uh, because many of the countries are already signatories to the Paris Convention. India, by the way, has uh, already uh, started in a big way. 
uh, and it uh, wants to uh, generate 175 gigawatt of energy uh, through renewables, out of which 100 would come out of solar, 60 would come out of uh, uh, wind and uh, so on. So okay. uh, the, the, the question okay. is to uh, uh, Mr. Birol, uh, uh, is it, I mean, what I'm saying is I'm overemphasizing or this is something which uh, the oil and gas uh, producing companies need to look into? Well, please. Thank you. So uh, I think you are not overemphasizing when, as I said, when you look at the numbers, there is a boom of solar uh, and the the good news is the cost is coming down substantially. The solar prices in the last five years reduced uh, by 80 percent. Can mention that the, uh, the oil industry also reduced the, the, the cost, but the, it was much more impressive in the case of solar, and it will continue. This is good news. Having said that, solar we are using for mainly for two reasons. One, ele ele generate electricity. Second, not much known, the, uh, the heater, so water heater. Both these cases, solar is not an alternative to oil. Solar is mainly alternative to coal, if you look at this, for the electricity generation, not to, because we use oil mainly and more and more for transportation and petrochemical industry. So in my view, solar will go very strongly but uh, there will be a change, generally in the energy sector, but there will be some constants within the change, and I believe we will need oil. Oil demand will also grow, but much less stronger than in the past as a result of renewable growth. Okay, and we will also have gas, natural gas. Very good. Um, we have time for one more quick question. Quick. Thank you. Please. Okay, so, So very quick question, uh, what's the future of energy as far as emerging uh, economies are concerned? I'm from Nigeria and uh, we have a huge energy gap, especially in the area of power. So what's the future of energy as far as emerging economies are concerned? Who wants to take that, I, one? I try that one? Please. Well, I, I think you have, first of all, uh, emerging economies is becoming a very difficult word. There are many different economies there in, under this definition. But in general, these are economies that have what mark, mature markets don't have, that is a robust demographic growth and a robust demand growth because of demography and also because of economic development. So in these parts of the world, you need to put a lot of infrastructure in place to supply demand quickly. So the, again, it's the issue of time, it's really important. And you have many solutions you can choose from today. Uh, 10 years ago, it was not like that. You, you had a very <coughs> blueprint solution, put some power plants, put some grids, and go on like that. Today, you can choose a lot of different ways. You can have a development bottom up, a lot of distributed generation, and build grids from the low voltage up to the high voltage, and then connect the whole thing. Or you can try that model again, big plants and go down to the, to the villages. It's really uh, an open solution and it very much depends on what kind of, uh, let's say, uh, energy sources you have locally and what kind of infrastructure you already have, if any, and what kind of legacy you want to leave. Today we see economic, uh, econ um, uh, emerging economies going from one end to the other of the spectrum with a very continuous uh, uh, gray, gray zone in between. I think as technology becomes easier and less, um, less expensive, the distributed generation first and big plants after will switch and will become more important. It's easier to implement, it requires less decision making and, and not big uh, state driven schemes. Later, when, when the economy picks up, you might have to add higher, bigger plants. But, I mean, it's, it's just in this very day, in these very years, it's, it's transitioning from one, one model to the other. We're out of time here. I think this is a good note on which to end, though, because it does speak to the transformation and the kinds of change, not just in what the power sources are, but how they are distributed, how they are used, and also to the gap between the developing world's questions and the developed world's questions. Um, thank you all so much uh, for exploring these issues with us. I think I'm leaving with um, the thoughts, actually, that you uh, summarized so well, Mr. Hirsch, about the role of markets as opposed to simply regulation. If I walked in wanting to know more about what the impact of 
uh, uh, a new U.S. president would be on the global climate move and the likelihood that two degrees would remain a global goal, I am now thinking more about the role, again, of markets and investment and the $60 trillion that um, have already been spent in building the world that we live in right now. Thank you so much. And that concludes our update for today. I appreciate your comment today.